the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John in the first chapter. Now listen for God's word to you. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Beth Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. And Nathanael said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, come and see. And when Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asked Jesus, where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? Oh, you will see greater things than these. And he said to Nathanael, Very truly I tell you, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's such a backwater place. A no-count place. It's a place you go through and not to. We've seen those places. Catula. <laughs> Ensenal. Turkey, Texas. Well, Bob Wills comes from Turkey, Texas, so we something good comes out of Turkey. You ever driven through one of those little places, one blinking light, and asked yourself, what idiot decided to put a town here in a sea of brush? La Prior, Texas. And yet, Philip tells this man, come and see this person about whom Moses and the law speaks, about the prophets speak about this person. Perhaps he's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He's Jesus from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Something so worth, someone so worthy of the words you used to describe him had to come from a city, at least a mid-sized city. And who is it that asks this question? Who is this 
Nathaniel. He asked a question. We know that from the text, but that's about it. Nathaniel is not listed by the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as one of the disciples. He didn't make the big 12. We are not sure who he is, in a way. He comes on the stage and says his piece, and then he exits and is no more anywhere. John's gospel is fascinating. And it's really interesting that Nathaniel breaks on the scene in the first chapter. John has given us these almost a massive theological poem in the prologue. In the beginning was the word. You remember all that, and all of a sudden, here comes Nathaniel. Jesus sees Nathaniel, and he says this Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Does Jesus mean that this, this man has never deceived anybody? Does he mean that he will not deceive anybody? And certainly, we in the Reformed faiths would say, Nathaniel is like every one of us. We have deceived. We hope we don't deceive longer. He's a man just like the rest of us. But why would Jesus say, in whom there is no deceit? I have long held that it is very difficult to interpret the New Testament unless you have some working understanding of the Old Testament. The word Israelite and deceit. is our focus. We must begin in Genesis with a man named Jacob. Now, Jacob was a twin, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. Isaac was. Jacob's brother Esau was born first. But as Esau is coming into the world, a hand reaches up and grabs Esau by the heel. And that baby was named Jacob. And it seemed that Jacob and Esau were destined to squabble for the rest of their lives. Jacob's name can be translated deceiver. And look at his life. Esau comes into the in from the field hunting. He is starving. And there's old Jacob over there cooking up a nice stew. And Jacob says, "Feed me." And Esau says, "Feed me. I'm famished." And Jacob says, "I'll tell you what. I'll give you some of this, but it's going to cost you." Your birthright. And stupidly, 
Esau sells his birthright for a bit of porridge and a biscuit. Deceiver, Jacob is. His father, Isaac, is blind. It comes time for the blessings to pass down. Primogenitor, firstborn, which would have been Esau and Jacob, following instructions of his mother, goes in and dresses like a man who goes hunting with long sheepskin on him so he would feel hairy like an outdoorsman. He deceives his father and receives the birthright. Later on, Jacob goes in fear of Esau to live with his mother's kin, a man named Laban, and all you get is one deception after another. Jacob dece deceiving uh, Laban and Laban deceiving, deceiving Jacob. The chickens come home to roost when he has worked seven years for his beautiful new bride. And he wakes up the morning after the wedding and find out it's the older sister. Laban has deceived him. And on and on it goes, even Jacob's wives and concubines deceive him and he's no more than a bumbling fool under the deceptions of his own wives and concubines. His own sons lie to him. You see the multicolored coat, it has blood on it. Yes, it is Joseph's coat, but he perished at the hands of a wild beast. When, in fact, the brothers had sold Joseph off to be a slave in Egypt. Jacob in deceit go hand in hand. It's a sordid tale in Genesis. And you must love it because it pulls no punches. Until one day, Jacob is coming back with his two wives and is wondering what Esau will do to him. The feud will go on, he assumes, and he lies down to sleep, and all of a sudden, in a dream, he sees it, a ladder going up into heaven and angels ascending and descending. Surely the Lord is in this place, he says. And listen to what Jesus said, because it's connection. You believe because I saw you under the fig tree? I tell you, you will see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. There is the connection between Israelite and deception and angels. The word Israel is a name that God gave Jacob after Jacob wrestled with God. 
It means the one who strives with God. But more later. Behold an Israelite, a God striver, in whom there is no deceit. Maybe it is because Nathan no longer tries to hide the fact that he is wrestling with his own angels. Maybe he has quit deceiving himself that his religious pilgrimage is where it should be, where it has been, and where it always will be. He's not deceiving himself any longer that he is satisfied with the status quo religious belief. Perhaps it has dawned on him that with things regarding God, he has no corner on the market. He doesn't have all the answers about God and about faith. Maybe Nathaniel has realized that you don't ride into the kingdom of God on the coattails of your family or on the coattails of your culture. Maybe he's decided there's something more to this God business. I'm looking for something more. The first words Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John are these. What do you seek? What are you looking for? It's as if John knows those who would hear or read later. Why are you looking here? Why are you listening thus? What are you looking for, really? And for those who are really looking and seeking, it's because perhaps something has unsettled us. The deceptions that were before about who we were in relation ship to God are no longer and and we become unsettled those strong foundations upon which we stood at, as our parents taught us and should have but there's something more to this if we were to ask Jacob what he sought. What are you looking for? I suspect we could identify with what Jacob said. You know, I wish all my problems with Esau would just go away. I wish Esau would get on his camel and go west, my friend, and pull off the planet. What are you looking for, Jacob? I wish that my wives and these concubines I've got, I wish they might all go visit their mothers and not come back. I wish my sons could get along and they wouldn't lie to me. I wish all my problems would just disappear. I 
And maybe these are things that shake us up. That are catalysts to ask ourselves that question, what really am I seeking? What is the meaning of life and how I fit into life? I just wish people would get along and there be harmony in the home and the workplace and the world. Maybe we might wish for economic security and none of those things are bad. But for some of us, we are unsettled from time to time. Is there not something more? I will tell you that it is my firm belief that if Jacob had not become Israel, in all probability we would have never heard of Jacob. Jacob has left old Laban, has taken his two cute daughters, Laban's two cute daughters, and now he has two wives and their servants. He's about to meet Esau, and I suspect he looked down for that big meeting where they were to meet across the plain, there's Esau with his camels and his tough men, and he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He sleeps that night, and in the middle of the night comes a stranger that we find out is an angel of the Lord. And they begin a tussle. A wrestling match, a fight, mixed martial arts. And there in the dust and the debris, the two men throw themselves at each other. And it's a long, long wrestling. And as the sun is going up, the angel says, I must leave. And Jacob reaches out and grabs him and says, I will not let you go until you have blessed me. And it's that statement, that statement, God sees and changes his name from the deceiver to the one who wrestles with God. And I think it's that demand that makes Jacob's faith and it becomes the faith of Israel, the strivers of God. I will not let you go. Behold, an Israelite, a striver with God, in whom there is no deceit, in whom he no longer deceives himself about who he is. Jacob, now Israel, Nathaniel, and a host of other of us come through this life and to this time and place. And we realize that life is not to be had and living out just from moment to moment. Living to consume. Until what we consume, consumes us.
I can only refer to what I know. I can wax eloquent, I guess, more or less, on the academics of faith. But in my pilgrimage, faith has been a constant wrestling, a constant throwing off of deceptions that I have about myself or deceptions that have been my legacy. I was a child of the manse, and for those of you without Scottish backgrounds, the manse was the house, the house uh, the, the pastor lived in, in Presbyterian sense. We got one. I lived and breathed on the faith of my own parents. God loved them. They did the best they could to knock some sense into a hard-headed kid. But I was baptized, right? I'm living on what mom and dad said. But that's a family faith, isn't it? Wonderful. But it was not my own. And it took some ups and downs in life to realize that it needed to be my own. I was deceiving myself that faith was all about what other people believed, and I just kind of grafted myself onto it. I mean, after all, how many of you have had your grandmother tell you this? Remember, you are a Christian first and a Presbyterian second, a very close second. That's my family. I'm surprised they didn't diaper me in a tartan. And one day, I realized that life was sometimes hard. But I'm inoculated, God. I got my McGregor tartan. I am inoculated. What is this? Time to wrestle with an angel. So I went to seminary. I started reading my Bible for myself, and wow, I didn't know this was in here. I thought the Bible always spoke with one voice. Theologians would call this univocal. Does the Bible speak univocally, one voice? Or are there many voices speaking about the one God? Well, I assumed it was like a jigsaw puzzle. If you really knew the rules, you could put all the scriptures together and have this wonderful, wonderful, 10,000 piece puzzle. I could shellac it in permanence. So I went to seminary and uh, I guess I came out of seminary being a heresy seeker, a, her a one who sought out heretics. After all, Good reform theology was the key, wasn't it? The key to biblical interpretation is to make sure you are in the right camp, 
so you read the right way, and Reformed theological perspective was the right way. And everybody who wasn't out of that tradition was just wrong. You know that works till you get close to them, those people who were just wrong. And you find out their faith may be more sincere than your own. So, I became quite perplexed. Everybody seems to have the same idea that their faith is the right one, why don't we get along? It makes no sense. It's time to wrestle with an angel. And so this church sent me back to school and said, you need to learn some more. And I did. And what I learned was that all of us I don't care what your name is, Nathaniel, Philip, Peter, James, Andrew, Martha, Mary. All of us use words to describe a God that is greater than our words. And that may be, in a way, what the scriptures do. Matthew is different than Mark, and Mark is different than Luke, and Matthew and John is totally out there. But what they do is give us perspectives. And we need to hear that voice. I could no longer go through a biblical text after I finished that course and just homogenize the whole thing and come out with the one. We are human beings and we use language to try to communicate. That's one reason why I like music. There are no words. Well, not the kind. We put words to it. And I learned that the scriptures give us a great perspective from many different angles on the same God. Boy, but that took some wrestling. And it took facing myself in the sense that, are you really after me so that you can say that you know more than the next person? That's what I had to ask myself. My faith has been deconstructed and retrieved many times, and it will continue. Because there were times I just said, well, it would be so much easier to forget the whole ball of wax. My name is Israel. I strive with God. And oftentimes, at the break of dawn, it is all I can do to grab hold and say, I will not let you go. Lord, I will not let you go because I cannot let you go. I cannot. I don't know if you no Israel or Nathaniel, but I suspect you do in your more honest times that sometimes the greatest statement of faith is to turn to God and say, After the Holocaust and the end of World War II, a group of rabbis got together and put God on trial. 
for allowing the Holocaust to happen to God's people. And then they found God guilty. And then it was the hour of worship and they all went and worshiped God. A faith. Faith of Israel. The wrestlers with God. That would not let go. In conclusion, if you find your old faith is not working, look at the deceptions you have believed. Look at the deceptions within yourself and declare, I will not let you go. Lord, bless me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.